she goes, I'm going to be better by our anniversary. And I kind of at the time was like, she's on morphine. She's in a lot of pain. Like, that's a pretty exact date. And I was like, well, why do you, you know, why do you think that? And she goes, God told me. And my mom isn't religious. You're listening to Studio 22. So I first watched your TED Talk, the one that went viral talking about the auto, autoimmune diseases mm-hmm. and the struggle with nutrition, talking about self-discipline and how that plays a part in nutrition. Did they not air that? Yeah. So uh, the guy, it, it was TEDx, so I was invited to speak. And the guy who organized it was incredibly sweet. He bothered them for about eight months. They said it violated community guidelines, but I'd written... And I wasn't reading off a script or anything, but I would designed the speech so that it didn't violate community guidelines. So they couldn't point to what I'd violated. So it was more of an ideological thing that they were just like, we don't want this information out there, I think. Uh, but it worked out because, you know, I put it up on YouTube and said TEDx wouldn't post this. And it got way more views that way. So it, it worked out extremely well in the end. Yeah, one of those vague youtube bands where they don't really give yeah. a reason right it, it, exactly one of those and we went back and forth for a long time to try and figure it out but nope so what do you think is controversial about a nutritional plan well i mean the nutritional plan was like what the ted video said and what's happened to me was i had a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis growing up which, and i was on a, a number of medications it was very severe i ended up with my hip and ankle replaced at 17 from the arthritis and the medical route just, it wasn't working for me. I was on multiple immune suppressants, amongst other things like antidepressants and just something to help me sleep, Adderall to stay awake. Like I was extremely ill and I started looking into diet just to see if maybe that could make me feel better. Not that I had any faith that that would even impact any of my health problems, but I ended up through a period of about two years of cutting out foods, I ended up only eating meat. And so I can see why it's controversial because it's like somebody coming online saying, I only ate meat and I had an autoimmune disorder and it's gone. And I've seen this work for thousands and thousands of other people. And like maybe the medical community should look into it a little bit. I thought that the way I phrased it, maybe people should take notice and do some research. I can see why it's controversial, but regardless of the controversy, it's like what happened anyway. I get it from their perspective, but I mean, it was a poor decision on their part. So you think it was more the tie to the medical components in the medical community versus the straight nutrition, essentially? Uh, I think so. I mean, they were like, they never specified what I did wrong, but I assume it would be making claims that dietary intervention can cure or at least help disease. Although there are a number of talks that are on TED that talk about different diets and they're up, but all meat was definitely not okay in their eyes. Right. So it's kind of interfering with pharmaceuticals, essentially. And like, who knows? Who knows what the background there is? It could have been that. There are a lot of vegan videos up on TED. uh, So that seems to be okay. There are even ketogenic diets that are discussed. And technically what I'm doing, it's like a carnivorous, it's a ketogenic diet. It just doesn't have plants. It was too new at that point, I guess. So we posted on YouTube. It went viral. Was that your first experience with media, social media, getting tons of views in that way? I I probably didn't expect it to get as many views as it did, uh, maybe because it was a short form video. I've experienced popular podcast episodes or something like that. I don't think that was... Oh, and I've done, you know, response videos for media outlets covering my dad. And so those get a number of views too. So it wasn't my first time. Um, It was probably the biggest thing I'd put out at that point about diet though. How did that affect the rest of your trajectory in social media in your career as an online persona? So that video was put out when I was maybe two years into podcasting. It seems like (laughs) I started podcasting because I was trying to look into health problems. And so it started being kind of health focused. And then I started bringing on people I was interested in like business and just whoever I wanted to talk to and trying to move away from the diet. So it was like, because I didn't want to be this girl who only eats meat and that's what I'm known for. But I went on, I had that go viral. People are interested in it, I guess. Um, I went on Pierce Morgan and had a clip go viral, like crazy, crazy views. I think 23 million on like what I eat in a day. That was great. That, it was like, I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I can't really like stop this part of who I am from being 
what I'm known for, at least a percentage of what I'm known for. It's funny. Yeah, people find it interesting, right? They want to hear like, more what? about it. And- yeah, and there are a lot of people who are sick too. So like a, a good percentage of the people watching have somebody who ha- like know someone who has an autoimmune disorder or they have anxiety or brain fog or depression and they're like, oh, if there's a way out of that, great. Oh, 100%. I mean, they want to relate to it. They want to learn from it. It's an inspiring story. And I, I can see tons of reasons why it's appealing, right? You know, I did, a, I did a live stream the other day with what some would call a controversial kind of media cultural critic uh, named Ryan Kennel of the Ryan Kennel Outpost. And it was an interesting conversation because we were talking about me working within the industry of entertainment, you know, making films and doing all producing and all that. And him kind of critiquing the industry and how we can try to find common ground and he's like all i do is give my opinion on movies like star wars and people want to like destroy me and take my channel down right so like have you found that censorship in other realms within media and you know how do you think it'll play on forward of you know whether it's entertainment or dietary stuff or medicine you know how do you see that playing out You know what? I haven't been that involved in production to a level to experience censorship there. I don't think I've experienced it in like Hollywood or anything just because I haven't been exposed to it. Right. So is it it, it tricky? um, It's interesting when you're, you know, trying to get a project done, but there's restrictions or, Uh, you know, things you shouldn't talk about. Yeah. You know what I have experienced? So we, we started Peterson Academy and we've been hiring producers and things to to produce our courses and edit them. And we have some people working who used to work in Hollywood and got sick and tired of working in Hollywood because of the restrictions. So like one guy was doing children's content and he was like, I can't publish what I want. I can't produce what I want. Like all the storylines have a little bit of ideology like built into it. And it's like, I wanted to come here for the story for kids, not for like underlying ideology built into it. Right. So that, that I've been, so I've heard about it kind of secondhand. I just haven't seen it. It's kind of crazy if you look around, like the movies coming out, you can kind of, I think if you're looking out for it, you'll see it more, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what sucks too? I've noticed this too. Like when you were watching movies in 2000 and even like 2010, you kind of just watch the movie and you're like, okay, it's a good movie or it's a bad movie. And I've noticed myself watching movies now and I'm so primed to be like, is there, you know, ideology or propaganda in here that I feel like I'm hypersensitized. So maybe sometimes it's a totally neutral movie and I'm like, Okay, but that character was placed for a reason, right. which didn't even pop into my head 10 years ago. Like, it's not good. I totally agree. It's, um, I think our culture has completely shifted into politics everywhere, agendas everywhere, teams, tribalism. It's really uh, kind of frustrating and, and sad sometimes. I was really excited to ask you about the Peterson Academy, the university you're starting with your family. And I've watched a lot of your videos on it and you know, talking about balancing family life and, you know, all the work you've been doing. What has that process been like? And, you know, how far along are you and all that? So we did a kind of closed beta. So we opened it up for enrollment about a month ago and then closed it so nobody else could enroll on the platform, partly because we had to do user testing, but partly because we wanted to get it out because we think it's time to get it out. And that was overwhelmingly successful. We had we had almost oh, wow. 30,000 people sign up. Wild, wild numbers. So there's a course component that is kind of, you know, Netflixy. So there are a whole bunch of university level courses there, eight hour lectures from like professors around the world that are really good. And those are all produced and edited in as entertaining a way as we could do. And then there's a social media component. So people actually have a community. It's been going amazingly well. So now it's open to everybody um, two days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. We clo- we closed it down for about three weeks to just make sure that we could get all the kinks out before we launched it, but it, it's available now. So it's it's been amazing. That I mean, congratulations. That sounds like Thank it's you. just crushing it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a ton. It's been a ton of work. Like There's a lot of not sleeping. That Yeah, that can be tough. <laughs> what has that been like balancing with family life as well? I know family is extremely important to you and you know, have you found scheduling and like you said, long nights, is it, has it been tough to manage or how has that process been? I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty set up. I have a seven year old. So I was, I'm used, I have a seven year old and a nine month old. So trying to build the company right after having a baby, like over the last nine months, definitely right after I had the baby, 
I wasn't thinking about the company, like right. obviously. More recently, we're, like we're pretty set up. I have stay at home like nannies that are there, which I just wouldn't be able to build a company if I didn't have somebody in house that was helping. And we found these great like women that is kind of like having a grandma that lives with you. I think as a female too, you always have some mom guilt and it doesn't matter what you do. It's always there. So even if you're, you know, even if you stay home with your kids and you don't do anything else, then you get like, I have friends who do that and like a lot of them enjoy it, but then they're kind of missing an outlet. And then if you have work, then there's always part of you that's like, I feel bad for not being there, you know, and I work, I've, I've got it pretty good though, because we work from home, so I don't have to go to an office. So I'm there all the time. That's nice. Yeah. So a lot of the work we're doing, like my baby's crawling around the floor. Right. So it like we're pretty set up. So it hasn't been that difficult for me. And I think that's because I have I've had practice like with my seven year old. I didn't have help. So it was like seven, you know, baby on your lap while I'm working, which was like that's way harder than having a nanny at home. This is basically the best setup you could have. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned your father earlier, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Have there been parental styles or morals that principles that you've kind of gotten from your parents and then passed down to your children? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I mean, one of my one of the things my dad taught me was like, make sure you don't let your kids do anything that bugs you, which is fair. It's like you don't want the kid that you bring to a restaurant that like goes around and knocks all the salt shakers off. Oh, the, yeah. Because people don't even they're like, that's a bad kid, but that's a terrible parent. Yeah. Right? You're not going to blame the four year old for being a brat. You're going to be like, what are you doing as a parent? So I think that's helped a lot. That's probably the big one. So I'm pretty, I wouldn't say I'm strict, but I've also seen, especially with my seven-year-old, that the more boundaries you put that are good for them, the calmer they are. So if you right. go the like, I'm a, I'm a nice parent, I let my kid do whatever they want and I give them everything, it causes like existential dread in the kid where they're just like, where are the boundaries? Like I can do anything. Like it's really not good for them everything's it's not it's not a strict schedule but like dinner's around the same time bedtime is at the same time um there are certain ways you can't act like you can't they go to school and come back and they're like they pick up some horrible kid's behavior and you're like why you can't act like that that's not good behavior and then they just they'll stop and like calm down it's like okay so so giving kids these firm boundaries i probably learned that from my dad consistency boundaries yeah, yeah. And just like, and you want to, like, as a parent, you want them to grow up and like easily make friends and be taken seriously in conversation and be liked. And so showing them what kind of behavior is appropriate and what kind of behavior isn't appropriate is really important. It's not mean. It's just like, that's not like, trust me, if you do that, it's not going to go well in the real world. So like, don't do that. How has it been, you know, raising a family in the public spotlight with, you know, the amount of followers and media attention you and your family get has that been um, a struggle or have you had to adapt at all it's all a little weird like it's definitely a bit weird but I don't really go out very much so I don't actually experience the weirdness that often like I'm usually at home working or with my family and so sometimes when we go out it's weird but we don't go out very often Especially with a newborn, a relatively yeah. newborn, yeah. It's also like, I'm not really phased by it. There was, I don't remember, it was like three months ago, people got mad at me on X and somebody posted, oh, and it made my dad really mad. <laughs> somebody posted a picture of my baby and called called uh, George retarded. And my dad was so mad. And my husband and I were kind of like, I don't know if we were just not phased by it. We're just like, oh. <laughs> okay a little bit funny. Like, it's not funny if you actually think about it, but I think it's happened like, People online can be so mean so that mean. it's just like, who does that? Right. Like, it's so ridiculous. Like, who, what happened in your life that you're posting some other person's baby just to get a, like a rise out of them? The absurdity uh, of it. Almost, it's right? mostly the absurdity of it. It might be that there's, there was so much media, especially in like 2018, 2019, maybe 2020, that it really doesn't bug me at all anymore. And I am mostly at home. And like most people I meet are super nice. So it hasn't been that hard. Like I don't think I'm also at the level that it gets hard. Yeah, like at a stage in your life where you're working so much, you've got a nine month old and a seven. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But but the online stuff sounds like it's definitely there regardless, no matter what, right? Like, yeah. 
no matter who you are, if you're at a certain level, there's going to be that essentially. Yeah, for sure. And we had like, I've found that because Peterson Academy is new, whenever there's a negative comment, and these aren't people who are signed up to the platform. These are people that are just like, if I signed up, I bet it would look like this, you know? Yeah. And that's, I've noticed over the last couple of months, that that's a more sensitive topic. Which is funny because it's like, does that mean there's something wrong with me if I'm not? But I think I'm so used to the personal attacks that it's like, if there's this new thing, I'm like, that's that needs to be protected. So that's right. that's been, I'm definitely more sensitive there, but it doesn't really bother me. Elon Musk just announced that, you know, he's he has this rocket and he's going to Mars. Oh, did he really? Oh, yeah. Like oh, last damn. week. Oh, super cool. And Hell yeah, Elon. If you, yeah. And if you look on Instagram or X, the comments underneath are like, they suck. They really suck. They're not like, that's awesome. There's some people that are like, that's awesome. But a lot of people are like, well, why didn't you just cure world hunger first? Right. And I was like, why didn't you cure world <laughs> hunger first? Like, who, who, like what? So I was like, if they're criticizing that, then there's no way anyone else is getting away scot-free. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree. It seems like Elon is up there with some of the most criticized as well, right? Uh, definitely, yeah. Which is really kind of crazy. Yeah, it's the man who's, you know, trying to spend a ton of money and defend free speech by owning the platform. Is... Uh, yeah. And that was basically like, I don't think he actually wanted to. I mean, I think he tried to get out of the X deal. Like, I don't think he wanted a social media platform, but he was like, people need it for free speech. So I'll do it. So that was kind right. of just like a favor to the public or like, let's give fast internet to the whole world. Yeah, if anything, it just brought more toxicity into his life, right? I mean, oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, he's doing a lot of his principles and actions are actually, you know, what would be considered liberal or progressive, like electric cars, yeah, you know, and like all that. And I love that diagram he made like a long, long time ago where it's like, I'm here and then everything moved left. Yeah, like, yeah, he's yeah. still here, right? Which, like, it's true though. Yeah. It, it's definitely true. To go back to the academy for a little bit, what would be, what are some of like your favorite courses and what can people expect there? Like what would be some of the big ones? Okay, so we're going pretty heavy into psychology and philosophy uh, and great books. My dad has this list on his website of, of great books. So it's like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Freud, Jung, Nietzsche, stuff like that. Uh, so we're going pretty heavy in that direction. And our plan, we have 18 courses right now. We have 40 in production. We're rolling out three new ones a month. And these are eight hour long courses. And our goal is to put out, and I think we can do it in the next about a year, a general education curriculum. So that's about 96 courses that are our length, which is what we think is equivalent to a university general education degree. Right. And it would give, like, once you go through that, it would give people general knowledge, like an in, intro to chem, intro to bio, intro to physics. Like, oh, yeah. So, so those in, intro to personal finance, because you need like just to be financially literate to a certain level. And then a huge background in great books and philosophers and psychology. So we have like we're rolling per like that personality course out in December. My favorite course right now, I mean, dad has a course on Nietzsche on there, which is definitely cool. There's a course on cosmology, which is cool. And then we have Plato, which is cool. Like there are a number. Oh, and we have a like intro to nutrition with Max Lugavere, which is just like, it's not carnivore diet. It, it's just like pretty smart. It's not what you would learn in regular university, but it's like, don't eat high carbs all the time or you're going to get extremely ill. Right. Like meat isn't bad. It's actually a health food. Like just things that you think people should know. Uh, so that's what's on the platform. Your father is extremely interested in, you know, obviously history and history of communism and dictators. And I remember watching a video and he was like showing off paintings of famous dictators oh in the gosh. house. And that was amazing. Um, is there, is, are there some history courses? Yes. Or any yes. Of that? Yeah. 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 For sure. So we've got a course on great leaders right now. So that it has like Churchill, Thatcher, a number of other famous leaders and like what was kind of similar about them that you can implement. Okay. So we've got great leaders. We've got, philosophy courses that are kind of historical, like modern philosophy and postmodern philosophy. And then we're rolling out history of the Soviet Union in October by Michael Malice. Which, oh, wow. 
Yeah. So <laughs> that's fun. And then, yes, we're going to have general history, like wor- a, an overview of world history. So, yes, that will be part of it. Not just psychology and philosophy, but world history. We're just trying to give people a general, what would you expect a smart person to know if you were having a conversation with them? Yeah, the finance component seems extremely applicable, right, for everyday life. Yeah. Um, and then the GEs as well. Like, obviously, every college has like some GE pro. I did not do well in my GEs in college, but I was in the film program and, you know, doing that. But I, I got, you know, good enough to get by. <laughs> um, but those are always good to have as like a core. Yeah. And I mean, mo- most of it's just most of it's like rather than general education, it's like you should know these authors and read these good books. We've got like a history of music. So if you hear Beethoven or something like that, you can go, oh, like I, I recognize uh, that musician. Nice symphony and, yeah. yeah. Just so you, people who don't have any type of like kind of classical education background can, you know, walk into a sophisticated room and recognize the music and recognize any the philosophers that are brought up or historical events that are brought up and just not seem like a moron in a conversation. That's our goal. Like That's go through good. our general education and no matter what conversation you join, you won't look like a moron. I love that. That's a good motto right there. <laughs> You're listening to Studio 22. So who are some of the other notable uh, professors or lecturers that you have at the Peterson Academy? So I mentioned Max Lugavere and I mentioned Michael Malice and Michael Malice's course is coming out. We're launching, my dad's obviously on there and he's releasing three or four courses a year. Uh, and then... We're launching Bishop Barron soon to teach kind of how uh, how the Bible's impacted like Western civilization. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's a very interesting course. And then Brian Keating, he's the one teaching an intro to cosmology. So he's been on Rogan. He's yep. very entertaining as well. Oh, and Verveke, John Verveke, he's teaching a number of courses on psychology, some higher level courses on like rationality, intelligence, spirituality, like really deep courses. He's teaching a bunch. And then most of our other professors are top professors at like Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, top universities. So we didn't just look for, you know, notable people. It's nice to have, you know, obviously for marketing purposes too, if you want, if you have a great lecture and they also have an online presence, then that's amazing. But most of our professors i'd say we found through word of mouth and then from watching videos online being like this guy's really engaging like it's kind of i mean people watch long-form podcasts but those are more entertaining to watch like an eight-hour lecture the lecture has to be has to be like top 0.5 percent of all lecturers to stay engaged so we found those people and we kind of designed the courses for people with like add i was like i have a really hard time i have a hard time listening to podcasts let alone watching them like usually i'll read the transcript which I don't know how many people do that, but that's what that's, that's what interesting. I, yeah, yeah. I was like, and you've like, done I so can. many good ones. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I can do like clips and things. I was like, if I'm gonna, if we're gonna build this out and we're making lectures, then if we can keep me engaged, we're gonna be just fine. So good we, we have. Yeah, exactly. I haven't seen like uh, I went to do two different universities and I did two half degrees and then I stopped going to university and started working for my dad. So I was like, there's so much opportunity here. I don't need the degree like what's the sure. degree going to get me really so i have like half a degree in classics and psychology and half a degree in biomedical science and i took some online courses and they were just like so like insulting to watch just like somebody droning on about something they weren't very good at and it was just like this is so disappointing i had this idea of university that i was like going to oxford or cambridge or harvard where you're like it's glorious all the professors are brilliant all the students are intellectual and that and my university experience was just like oh this is this seems kind of scammy right <laughs> like a little little scammy i mean some of the best companies products are created out of a you know i did this but i want to improve it mm-hmm. right like mm-hmm. i experienced something but here's a way to improve it. So it sounds yeah. like, yeah, you have an experience and, and there's a brand narrative to that and makes perfect sense. You guys have an incredible mix of, you know, seasoned professors and entertainers and personalities just all culminating into one epic university. It's been really fun. Like not, like I said, not a lot of sleep, but like overwhelming success so far and we're building out like crazy. So it's going to be even bigger in a year. The, so you mentioned um, a course on Christianity, mm-hmm. and you've been public about your 
you know, I guess transition spiritually into becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. What has that process been like and how has it influenced your work life, your family life and everything else? I grew up like my dad being my dad, I was always taught the psycho psychological significance of the Bible, like why those biblical stories were important on a psychological psychological level. Uh, and I, I understood that they were important stories, but that was about it. And I went to like public high school in Toronto and I don't even think I met a Christian until I was like 28. Like really, I just, nobody I knew. I always thought of them as kind of the people that are a, a like kind of obnoxious and think Harry Potter is evil. And <laughs> that was like basically it. And like, I remember that. So I had this biased view or like naive people who don't believe in evolution. Like that was my view, which I think is pretty normal for atheists or agnostics or people who aren't religious. It's like, that's the view. And then my mom got my, both my parents got really sick. First, a whole bunch of weird things happened. So like my dad got famous on YouTube and then got more famous and more famous and uh, in a very controversial way that was very stressful. And that was really weird to see, like just coming from somebody who doesn't have any background in having an online brand or any type of fame. It was like, oh my gosh, my dad's on the front of a newspaper. Like that's crazy. Anyway, so all that happened. My parents both got really sick. My mom got diagnosed with a just deadly form of cancer and she's, she's fine, but she wasn't fine. It was really right. bad. And she had surgery and the surgery was successful, but they, this was in Canada. They, um, they nicked a lymph duct. And the problem with like, I didn't even know what any of this was. The problem with that is it's very hard to find the nick and it, it like slowly kills you unless you can heal that. Oh, man. So she was stuck in the hospital for about three months after that. And we were, we ended up flying down to America to go to a different hospital. Um, and they did surgery and that didn't work. But in the midst of that, she goes, I'm going to be better by our anniversary. And I kind of at the time was like, she's on morphine. She's in a lot of pain. Like that's a pretty exact date. And I was like, well, why do you, you know, why do you think that? And she goes, God told me. And my mom isn't religious. So oh, that wow. was weird. Right. And she started praying. Uh, she started praying the rosary at the time too. And I was like, well, you know, logically that's what somebody who's dying would do. Like you like uh, try to get some sort of relief from anything in the hospital. So I kind of brushed all that off. But after she had this surgery, not work to fix the, um, surgical mistake she healed on my parents anniversary and this was like in the hospital the surgeons are like yeah unsuccessful surgery we couldn't find the nick and then it was like a week and a half later and they were like you're not it's it's healed we like we don't know what happened and she was like it was god and just like that yeah and she called that two months before she said, I'm going to, you know, be better. I don't know on if she said day. on or by, I can't remember, but it right. was like the anniversary was a date for some reason. Wow. And after that, I was like, that's too coincidental for me to rationally explain. Oh. And then the other thing that happened is after that she was, so she was in rough shape. She was really skinny and like, she had a whole bunch of healing to do after that, but her demeanor changed. So she was much more patient, much more kind and like suddenly religious. It was enough of a personal change I saw in her that I was like, that is like, it's still my mom, but it's a different mom. So I saw those two things happen and I was like, I can't rationalize why that would happen unless God is real. And then I saw how she was acting towards people with more compassion and kindness and forgiveness and patience. And I was like, I want that. Like, I want to be like that. And I want to have that feeling she has because she was just like calm and she didn't have, she didn't have any existential dread that like humans have. And I was like, that I want, but I yeah. don't know how to get that. Like, even though I saw what I saw, that wasn't like a something switched on and I suddenly believed. Over the next couple of years, I was like, okay, I'm going to read the Bible. I, I met my husband about a year, a year after that, and he helped a lot too because he comes from a Christian family and I hadn't met a Christian family. And when I first met him, I was like, oh, I really like this guy. He's got like a calming presence. Uh, and he was like, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I don't even really know what that, that's cool. <laughs> but like, I don't even I want really, that too. yeah, I want that too. I was like, I'm not, you know, so it was like, that's cool. And I met his family and they all had, they were just like, I was, so at that time, like I had a, a kid, I was divorced and I was like, oh, I'm going to go meet a family 
of like conservative Christians and they're going to think that I'm a heathen, like <laughs> for sure. And I'm, I went to meet his family and they were all really nice. And it was like, it was also a put together family. And I think most of my friends growing up had like fractured families somehow. So this is the first family I've seen that like, even though there's still problems, they still have this like warm glow about them. Mm -hmm. And so I was reading the Bible and I was praying and trying to like kind of walk in that way. But it wasn't, and I believed, I was like, this makes sense. There's, there's enough signs that it makes sense. And I was like, I've like, I believe the stories are real, but I don't think I, I wasn't believing like all the way it lines up, but like, I, I just didn't believe down to my core. And then I had an experience. I'm not going to get into the experience, but I had an experience that like brought me to my knees. And I've had these, you know, if you go through something really hard, then you have those experiences that you're like, I'm not religious, but like, oh, if God's out there, that would be great. And can he help me right now? Of course. Like I've, I've had those experiences. And, and this time it was similar, like, please. But it was like, I'm, tr it was like, I'm trying, I'm praying, like, please. I spent about three hours praying. And then I was in the bathroom and I was like, and then I had this thought, and I don't know if this is what did it, but I had this thought. I was just trying to get there in a rational way. Like what, like prove God which right, nobody right, can right. do. And so I was trying to, and I'd been trying to like prove it through all these like weird coincidences and things. And I had a thought and I think it was just, for, I don't think it was my thought. And it, it was, you have to have faith. Like Christianity is based on faith. And I'd never thought about that word before, but faith isn't someone's going to come up to you and rationalize why God is real. And then you'll believe because then you wouldn't need faith. You have evidence, right? right? People go about like, pastors will go on podcasts and they'll debate atheists about like whether or not Satan exists or whether or not God exists. And like, they're not going to, you know, win rationally because it's not rational. It's faith-based. And for some reason, I, th I thought that and was like, oh, and it was like, and I don't even want to compare it to this really, but it's the closest thing like on earth that I can get to. Have you done shrooms? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was like a it was like shroom-like experience, except there were no shrooms involved. Right. So it felt like heaven opened up. I could feel the Holy Spirit descend. And what it felt like was I got shown, here's all the things you're doing wrong in your life. Yeah. All right. So I got that. And it was like, you know, you're trying to act like a good person, but here are all the micro ways that you're sinning. So being irritated at someone who's taking up time when you're busy. Like just little, like little things that ever, you know, people do. And I got shown like how shitty I was as like a heavenly perspective of everything. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I felt this overwhelming sense of forgiveness that was like, it was just like pure love forgiveness Conch for being a, like a sinful person. So I had this all happen. And after that, I moved from being like, you know, I believe this is true to I know this is true. Like you don't go through. And for some reason, I, I'm sure some people can be brought up in a Christian household and be like, yeah, totally makes sense. Logical. You know, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and God is real and I'm going to heaven. And they don't need some sort of like mind shattering spiritual experience. But I mean, that's what happened to me. And I've heard other people because I've seen people talking about this stuff and like people that were in a really dark place and suddenly they're like, yeah, Jesus saved me and I'm saved now. Uh, and so I'd seen those before, but I didn't get what people meant by saved until I felt the forgiveness and love. And then I was like, oh, that's what they mean. I get it. So then things that changed. Well, a big thing that changed, I think, is I've been through a lot of bad things like uh, being chronically ill was miserable for like two decades and then my parents almost dying was miserable for like four years and divorce isn't fun like no <laughs> like a, a, a lot of bad things have happened and because I've gotten through them I've been like I'm pretty good at getting through bad things so when they happen again I can go I can I can do it but now when stressful things happen it's like God's got me which is huge it's different than like I can weather the storm. It's like, I don't have to weather the storm by myself. And there's like, and it's out of like, a lot of this is out of my control because I'm a type A control freak. So if there's a problem, like I'm going to, I'll spend 10 years trying to fix it. Right, which, trying to solve it. Yeah, which I, I think is what brought me to only eating meat. I was like, I'm just going to literally try everything I can possibly try to cure an autoimmune disorder until something clicks. Yep. Right? 
and I'm still like, I still have that part of me, but now I know it's not just like, it's not in the greater scheme of things. It's not up to me, which is a huge relief. Yeah. Like, so the existential angst and I saw this happen to my mom. And so as soon as I, like, I called my mom and I was like, I get it. Like, I get it. It's been maybe three years before she got it, three years after she got saved. But I called her and I was like, I get, like, I, I get it. It's honestly a beautiful story. If you, you know, frame it of the lens of the, you know, the, the enlightenment side and the being able to handle adversity. And it really is a beautiful story. Um, and I think everyone has like, their own unique kind of journey to either finding God or some sort of spiritual experience. Hopefully, right? We'd hope um, yeah. we'd get to a point like I, that. And, people like need it. Yeah, and get to that relief that you described, right? Yeah. That, you know, God's got me. And I was baptized Episcopalian and have grown up. My mom is very Christian, I'll just say. It's an amazing, it's an amazing feeling. Did you find that the newfound faith and Christianity had given you a different perspective on your healing when, when you were growing up and getting through that? Definitely. I mean, I, like, I was thinking about things through a rational lens my entire life. And then as soon as like I converted or was saved, I was like, there's gotta be some demons involved there. Like, and yeah. it, it's funny. Cause even I always, I was like, I feel like Job, I was really yeah. sick. Like and in the story of Job, he gets like, he gets tortured by Satan, right? And he's a, this good guy and he just like, he loses his family and he loses all his stuff. And then his friend, and he gets really sick and he's like covered in, in, in boils and his friends yeah. are like, well, you did something to deserve this. <laughs> yeah. And my dad, I grew up mostly knowing the psychological significance of the Old Testament. And so I knew about Job and like, we joked about that all the time because I had like, I had skin issues. It, it was bad. It was skin issues. Like I couldn't get out of bed. I like... My joints were disintegrating. It was like movie level sick. And so looking back on it, I, uh, I think I can see like God trying to get my attention in, in certain ways and things. Um, and I think there's probably, I mean, if we're living in a fallen world, then a lot of what happens to people makes a lot more sense than, <laughs> than if we're living in a fully rational world. So yeah, it's changed my perspective looking back. Um, have you read any Eckhart Tolle by any chance? You know what? I haven't. I've been recommended his book so many times. The, Do you like it? The Power of Now or yeah, The New Earth? The, or, the Power of Now, that yeah, one. Absolutely. Yeah. He when I discovered those books, I had a it was a big transformative experience in my life because I was kinda in my mid twenties and it really taught me how to, you know, recognize ego in myself and others and um experience a lot of growth and kind of get out of that younger stage of my life I think a lot of it was timing and I was like ready to receive that information mm -hmm. but you know Eckhart's story and he'd be a great person for you guys to look at for a course or something too but he had another experience where he was basically I think he gambled his money away and was homeless on a park bench oh yeah and then boom it, like it just happened and I could I'm, I'm pretty sure those are like the exact details I'm just kind of butchering how I'm saying it but um, but yeah, like a profound sense of enlightenment and he, he immediately just found it. I just kind of, there were some similarities that you mentioned of like that, that moment, that Eureka moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a moment. It wasn't like a, you know, I was yearning for it and I wanted it, but you can't just give people that then somebody would be selling it and people could go right. through a program and get it, yep. you know, and like pastors try and, and different people try, but like sometimes it just hits. Are there any specific authors that you enjoy reading recreationally or, you know, religious works that you go through or stories? So I, like the Bible, so obviously. Yeah. So that I honestly, so I read voraciously until I was maybe 24. And I mean, like as a kid, I was reading into the night every night for my whole life because I wasn't outside playing sports and things. So oh, wow. I read a lot. And then when I was in my young 20s, I kind of switched over to scientific research because I was trying to figure out why I was sick. So I was like, just read all the literature and like immunology and what do my drugs do? Like the drugs I'm on, what are they doing at a cellular level? And so I, I was, so then I stopped reading for fun, but my fun was reading scientific literature. And then when I started getting really busy with work, I haven't really, I honestly haven't really read for fun unless it's something scientific that pertains to something I want to know for a while. 
So a lot oh. of the like a lot of the courses that we're teaching, uh, the great books, I read them in high school. I would like to. I'm just I can't like there's too many things to build and there's too many things we want to do with Peterson Academy. And like I had to pause my podcast. I paused my podcast for like I had to pause it because I actually got too busy with Peterson Academy. And there are too many things to do. So I'm trying to bring that back. So no, I really haven't had time to read in a long time. It makes sense if you're starting a university that a lot of your <laughs> recreational reading would be more like towards work and research and right. I mean, that's I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I miss it though. I was thinking about it the other day, especially after like looking at these courses and being like, these books are really good. Like I should probably carve out some time, but I could, I just can't, I can't right now. I have, I have too many things I want to do. Well, speaking of things you want to do, what is uh, upcoming on your schedule? What do you got like the next couple months, six months? So six months we've got, well, I'm going to start up my podcast at the end of September. So then episodes will come out once a week again. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. And I like, I don't want to just stop that. I like, I really like it. So that's going to be back. Hopefully I'll be able to finish my book by then. I have a book that's been like 90% done for a, like years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I think now I, I can finish that. And then a lot of it is going to be launching features on uh, Peterson Academy. So trying to extend out, like we've got We've got exams and quizzes right now, but we're going to implement an essay feature and a note-taking feature. And so a lot of it is like trying to set up teams to develop out those features, make sure the design is good, or just try to expand on that because like the opportunity is massive and it's like it's super fun. Yeah, I feel like with the university, the work essentially will never end in terms of like you can always yeah. add or yeah. Yeah, it's big. Like we're, we're going to have live events eventually. So oh, people wow. will be able to meet in person, go to conferences. Um, Very smart. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's it's huge. I just want to, like, turn all these ideas we have on paper for the next couple of years, like, into reality. Yeah, well, the podcast, the book, the university, sounds like you're going to be super busy and, and loving it all. I am right now. Heck, yeah. Well, I want to try to get you out of here at a reasonable hour. I really appreciate the time and, you know, deep diving some of these topics with me and cruising in. Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me on. That was fun. Thank you for watching Studio 22. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And follow our socials at Studio 22 Podcast.